darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy out When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand in shame
Hey, good morning. It is so good to be with you, Apex Church Online. My name is Neil, and it's my honor to lead us in these next few moments. I am really praying that this is going to be a unique, God-defined, God-inspired time and season for you. I am praying that whatever you're dealing with this week, whatever you're going through, whatever is happening in your world, that you are going to know right now the presence of the living God. We are so glad that you've chosen to be with us. Please let us know in the chat where you're watching from, whether that's literally across the street here in Peterhead or across the world. It would be great if we could just connect right now. Get that in the chat. Not only that, it would be great if we interact together. Hey, listen, I am believing that we are going to have church and we must be intentional and purpose about that today. Can I remind you that we will be having communion in a wee moment, so please get your juice and cracker or bread, and we'll gather around the table of the Lord. The Bible says this is the day the Lord has made. We are going to rejoice, and we are going to be glad in it. So as we go to worship right now, come on, why don't you get up off your seats? Why don't you lift that voice? Let's not just be spectators. Let's make sure that we get involved in this service today. Be an encouragement to those that are participating, but you get to be part of what is happening. I am so excited. This is a new day, the beginning of a new week. And as we look forward to the blessing of God and look back to what he's already done, it is with gratitude and thankfulness that we lift our voices right now and declare his goodness. So come on, church together, friends together, let's sing. Hey. 
what a powerful time of worship that was. Don't know about you, but I always feel good when I begin to sing about the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ. I find something incredible happens to me during a time of worship. It helps me to get my mind off of my circumstances, of what is happening directly in my world, whether that's good or bad. And when I focus on Jesus and when I focus on what he's done, I tell you what, my mind changes, my frame changes, my mindset changes it. What happens is this, that we move off of the situation and we get our eyes on Jesus. And that's why that old chorus simply said, didn't it? Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face. Well, we're going to pray right now. And I love the power of prayer. I love the fact that we get to unite together and we come unto God and we make a request known unto him. When we go to pray, it's not a list of wants. It's not a list of desires, but it's really coming before him and saying, God, these are situations in our life, in the life of our loved ones, that we really need divine intervention. And I believe that God hears every single prayer. You know, whether it's just a few lines, whether it's a little bit longer, whether it's one of those that are filled with great vocabulary or just simplistic language, it doesn't matter. As long as we come in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says that Jesus right now is at the right hand of Father God, making intercession for us. If you have a prayer request, why don't you get it in the chat right now and we will come into agreement with you. Listen, you may think uh, it's, it's small, it's, it's not, there's nothing, no big deal about that. Listen, if it's important to you, it's important to God. Get it in the chat and we are going to pray right now. So Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I thank you that it is the name above every other name. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we recognize that Lordship as believers, as Christians, as followers of Christ. We are thankful that we belong to the family of God. And we can come right now and I can lift my voice and we as a congregation, as church, as a family of believers, we can unite our voices and come into agreement. Lord, there are many folk in our fellowship that are sick right now. There are people that need a touch in their body. There are people that are ill. There are people that are sick. There are people, Lord, that need direction. There are people that need financial help. There are people that are dealing with family fragmentation. But God, into every one of these situations, we ask that you would move. Nothing is too hard and nothing is too difficult. You are able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we could ask or think. So right now I come to ask, O oh God, that into every home, everyone that's listening to my voice, wherever they are watching from, Lord, unspoken prayer requests, things that are dear to our heart, that only you know, God, I pray right now, for the peace of God that passes all understanding to be our portion. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, I hope you came into agreement with me right there as we were praying together. We're going to go to communion. Do you have your bread, your cracker, your juice? What a joy it always is to think of the sacrifice that was made on our by behalf, that Father God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to that cross to die for us. The fact that he came willingly, that no one forced him on that cross, but he came to pay that price so that we could come into that relationship with our God. And I've been reading from the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 4, verses 9 and 10. We read these words, but watch out. Be careful never to forget what you yourself have seen. Do not let these memories escape from your mind as long as you live and be sure to pass them on to your children and your grandchildren. Never forget the day when you stood before the Lord your God at Mount Sinai, where he told me, summon the people before me and I will personally instruct them. Then they will learn to fear me as long as they live and they will teach their children to fear me also. Do not let these memories escape from your mind. Recently, I was having a wonderful conversation with a saint of God, an elderly gentleman. And I was just so amazed as he was telling me stories from uh, many, many years ago of the faithfulness of God and just story upon story upon story. And 
as he was talking, I must be honest, uh, my eyes were getting bigger and bigger. And at one point he stopped and says, oh, you must be getting fed up hearing this almani, this old man going on and on. And I says, no. I says, you don't understand. My faith is being inspired. I am just amazed at what God has done in your life and is doing something for me. It's helping me to realize that if God can do that for you, then God can get involved in my situations. Tell me more, tell me more. And then he would tell me another story and, and I'd say, is there anything else? He says, well, can you take another story? I says, please tell me, tell me, tell me. And I want to say to you right now, many of you are listening to my voice. God has done incredible things for you. There are miracles that have happened in your world. God has literally opened a Red Sea. I know for you it wasn't an actual Red Sea, but a Red Sea situation. For you, there's been a time where you were experiencing lack and God provided. And can I just say this? Your testimony can become an inspiration and encouragement to others. People perhaps that are facing situation, they're wondering, God, where are you? People perhaps that are facing lack that are thinking, can God meet my needs? And that's why it's so important that from generation to generation, we tell of the wondrous works of God. And that's what I love about communion. I never tire of hearing about what God through Jesus Christ did for us to bring reconciliation. That's why the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Think about that. He who knew no sin, sinless, blameless, spotless. He who knew no sin on that cross when he willingly gave of his life, the Bible says he became sin. I can't even imagine what that must have felt like for the Lord Jesus Christ. I can't even imagine what that must have seemed or felt like for God the Father as He looked down upon His Son. I don't know what that must have been like for heaven and the angels to, to gaze down on Jesus Christ, He who knew no sin, who literally became sin. Why did He go through that? Why did he experience that? Well, the Bible tells us very clearly, so that we might become the righteousness of God. We were the sinners. We were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. We are, we are the ones who, through our life, have committed sin. We were the ones to blame. But the blameless one took the blame so that the ones who were to blame could be blameless in the sight of God. How? Through the body of Jesus Christ that was broken and His precious blood that was shed. The words of this song have been going through my heart and spirit all this week. It's living hope. And just listen to this verse. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. What beautiful words. Jesus Christ, my living hope. So as we take this bread and drink of the cup, I want you to remember we had no hope, but we have hope through Jesus Christ. So as we take this bread, thank you, Lord Jesus, for your body broken. We eat together in remembrance of what you have done. And now in like manner, we also take the cup and we drink of it. Jesus Christ, our living hope. Amen and amen. Well, I trust these moments when we have communion together that you really lean in and are remem remember the goodness of God, are reminded of the goodness of God. The Bible says from generation to generation, Jesus Christ is our living hope. Well, today we are going to continue 
our series Legends and Misfits. It is our summer series when we get to look over characters of the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament, and glean lessons from their life which will help us as we navigate the season that we find ourselves in. Man and woman, men like uh, Elijah, who the Bible says is flesh and blood just like us. People who had some great successes and people who had major challenges in their life, but God used every single one of us of them. And I think when we see that, we become aware that God could use us. I'm delighted today that Christina Morrison is going to come and she's going to share with us. So can I encourage you, would you lean in as she begins to share the word of God? Would you make sure that you say hello to Christina in the chat there? And would you please, if you know as she's speaking and she begins to share with us, would you show your appreciation for the words that are brought to us? I believe that this is going to be a great encouragement for every single one of us. So come on right now, Christina Morrison is going to come and we are getting prepared to hear from the word of the Lord. Thank you for letting me speak to you this morning. A few weeks ago, I was sitting listening to the book of Esther on the Bible app um, when I had a text from Neil asking if I would speak. And as I thought about my answer to the question, these three phrases came into my mind. You are significant. You have a purpose. You can be life-giving. Let me say that again. You are significant. You have a purpose. You can be life-giving. Many of you know the story of Esther. She was a young Jewish orphan girl in a strange country who, because of her looks, was chosen to be queen of all Persia. No one knew she was a Jew, but when the Jewish people were threatened with being wiped out by a law that the king had signed, she chose to put her life on the line and reveal who she was in an attempt to save her people. Where did Queen Esther's significance, purpose, and ability to be life-giving come from? Well, I have with me today, I like an object, a paintbrush. Nothing special really, a piece of wood with some hair on the end. And I must admit, I quite like painting and I can do a quite a decent job. But I know that in the hands of a master painter, maybe you know some local artists that are pretty good with a paintbrush, or someone like Michelangelo, this paintbrush can create something beautiful. I've also got with me a pencil and a ruler. Very simple. Now, I love to watch programs like Your Home Made Perfect, where a designer comes in and designs a perfect home for a couple who've been arguing for years about how they should best make their home look. And these designers come in and they change the home, not only to something that the owners could never have imagined, but it's something that is perfect for them. Um, I also got a video camera. Now we all know that Stephen Lawrence is great with a video camera. Um, my video making skills are, are fun, but not very professional. Um, if you want your wedding videoed, then you wouldn't ask me. But filmmakers can capture and create incredible films using just a camera. So why am I talking about paintbrushes, rulers and cameras? Well, a couple of weeks ago, Neil asked the question, can God use me? It's like a paintbrush asking a painter, can you use me? Or an architect asking a ruler and pencil, can you use me? Or a video person asking the video camera. These are just normal tools. And it's not because the tools are any different, it's whose hands the tools are actually in that makes the difference. We are the paintbrushes, we are the rulers and the pencils, we are the cameras. And if we try to do it on our own, it might turn out all right, or it might look awful. But in the hands of the master, God, the creator of all things, it reaches its full potential. The paintbrush is brilliant. It has everything it needs to do the job. It's correctly made. It's not like the person who made the paintbrush thought to themselves, I want to make a ruler, and it was a paintbrush that they made. 
No. The paintbrush has got everything it's made, it needs. It's correctly made. And you are not a mistake. God didn't try to make something else, and you were the result. No, he made you, because that is who he wanted. Philippians 2 verse 13 says, For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. So the first thing I want to talk about is you are significant. Your significance is simply in God. You will never find significance by doing something. You will only ever find it by being who God created you to be. You can search for significance your whole life and never find it until you stop and accept yourself for the person God sees, the person God created, the person God loves, the person God can work through. The paintbrush will never become any more than a paintbrush. But when it accepts that it is a paintbrush, that is created to paint, and the painter loves it, that the painter can use it, then it has significance. We talked about Esther, who was a refugee, an immigrant, living in a land that was not her own, surrounded by people who despised her because she was a Jew. She was an orphan. She was also a girl, which in those days was little more than property. She didn't choose to live where she lived. She could make no decisions about the places she wanted to visit, about the career she wanted to have, even about the man she wanted to marry. In the world's eyes, she was insignificant, a nobody with no purpose. You know, I wonder how many times we believe that lie, that we are insignificant. We're just living each day, busy with life, trying to be happy, trying to make other people happy. I want to tell you, like Esther, you are significant. In God's hands, Esther was to become a queen. God gave her the qualities she needed in order for her to fulfill her potential. And when she put herself in his hands, she became significant. You know, when you put your faith in him, you can become significant. When she put her faith in him, she became enough. When she took that step of faith, she had everything she needed. And I want you to remind yourself of this every day. Even better, if you can look yourself in the eye, in the, in the mirror, or in your phone, and say these things to yourself. Say, I was created by the King of Kings. I am significant. Because he made me who I am, I am enough. Because of who he is, I have all that I need. You are significant. The second thing I wanted to say was you have a purpose. So how do we know what our purpose is? How do we know we're actually doing the right thing? Well, this might help. First of all, you don't have to worry about your purpose. You see, God says that he has plans for you. And God says that he will bring about his purposes in our lives. So let's stop telling ourselves that we don't have a purpose. Because God does have a purpose. And can I tell you as well that your purpose is not your job? You might be a teacher, but that's not your purpose. You might be a police officer, but that's not your purpose. You might be a mum, a pastor, a cleaner, a fisherman, a business owner, but that's not your purpose. And your purpose is actually really simple. One day Jesus was asked by an expert in the law, what is the greatest commandment? Now remember, this man was a keeper of the law. It meant that he'd studied the law the whole of his life. He looked at it. It was his job, his purpose, to do the right thing and to make sure everybody else knew what the right thing was. What each act had to be done, how it had to be performed. He spent his life dedicated to studying the law and following its every letter. You know, as a mom, I often get sidetracked into thinking about everything my kids should be doing, what they should be achieving, how they should be behaving, all the things I need to do to make sure that happens. And I think this law expert was thinking the same thing. 
How can he make people better? How can he fulfill his purpose? Most of you know what Jesus replied, and yet how easy it is for us to forget. This is our simple purpose. Love God and love others. Don't, like me, get so caught up in the daily things that society says we should do that we forget the people we were made to love. We can do this in so many different ways, and our own individual gifts, talents, personalities, our jobs, will influence how we do it. We need to stop making excuses that we don't know what our purpose is, and simply do what God asks us to do, wherever we find ourselves. Love God and love others. Your purpose is not what you do or how you do it. It's the love that you give when you do it. You know, in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, we all know this verse. It says, If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Do you want a life full of purpose? Then love others. If you don't, you have nothing. In fact, you sound like a clanging cymbal. Instead of drawing people to God, we end up pushing them away. No one wants to hang out with a clashing cymbal, do they? Well, Esther went from being an orphan girl, a refugee, to being chosen by the king to become the queen of all Persia. She could have found her significance and her purpose in her new role. She could have lived in comfort and luxury. She could have focused on that as her purpose. But God made her queen so that she could have thought, God made me queen, so that's what I'm going to be. But she was faced with a decision. Was she going to live out her life as a queen and make that her purpose? Or would she choose to love God and love others, to make the ultimate sacrifice of laying down her life to save the lives of her people, most of whom were actually complete strangers to her? You know, we know she chose to step out in faith, to put herself in danger, in order to give others a chance to live. Our significance is found in who God created us to be. Our purpose is simply to love God and love others. But just because it's simple, it doesn't actually mean it's easy. Real love can be tough. In Romans 12, 9, 15, it says, Don't just pretend to love others, really love them. Hate what is wrong, hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honouring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. That sounds tough. Loving others is tough, and it can be a real challenge. I ask you to speak to yourself about your significance, but now I want you to think about how you can answer these questions, honestly. And we need to ask ourselves these questions daily, I think. Questions like, are there any ways that I'm pretending to love others instead of actually loving them? Do I sound like a clanging cymbal? Or are there any areas in my life where I'm being lazy with love? Who am I really putting first? Or do I return curses for curses in any area? 
Am I critical and harsh with those who don't think like I do? These are questions that we should ask ourselves often. We need to check our attitudes, check our feelings, check our words, check our actions, even give someone maybe close to you permission to tell you when you're clanging. You are significant. You have purpose. The third thing I want to say is you can be life-giving. You know, every time I see that church statement on our screen, a life-giving church in the heart of the community, it's a challenge. Because when we say church, it's not talking about something else. It's talking about me, and it's talking about you. We could, in fact, rephrase it and say, life-giving Christina at the heart of the community, or life-giving Daniel or Jennifer at the heart of our community. You know, Esther was in a place at the heart of her community. Would she use it for her own gain? Try to hang on to her own life for as long as possible? Or would she choose to be life-giving to those who had no voice, no defense, no choice? Am I choosing to be life-giving or am I just interested in making sure I'm okay? You know, once Esther knew her significance, God could use her. And once she chose to put herself in God's hands and love others, she fulfilled God's purpose. In knowing her significance and fulfilling God's purpose, she became life-giving. If we're not being life-giving, maybe it's because we haven't realized our significance. A person created by God, a paintbrush in God's hands that can make something beautiful. Or maybe if we're not being life-giving, it's because we're too busy trying to live for our own purposes, for what we can achieve, for what we can get. Maybe we're just trying to fit in with everybody else. We need to instead give our lives to loving God and loving others, really loving them. You know, we all actually give our lives for something. Maybe we're giving it away for position or power or acknowledgement, maybe for comfort and luxury, maybe for health. But none of these things will actually give us joy. None of these things will give us true life. It's only when we give our lives for God that we find true joy. It's only in loving God and others that we find our purpose and reach our full potential. Esther chose sacrifice and service over safety and comfort. Maybe you've never put your your life in God's hands Maybe you've never come to that point of realization that by living for yourself, you actually gain nothing. Maybe you're trying desperately to cling on to life and the best you can be, and you find yourself drained and tired. You know, in Matthew 10, 39, it says, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for him, you will find it. I challenge you to choose today to give your life to God, to say, I'm no longer going to live for myself. Put yourself in God's hands. You are significant. You have a purpose. You can be life-giving. Now, I think often we get intimidated by characters in the Bible and all that they achieve. We look at them as superheroes with special powers that accomplish great things instead of normal, fearful, nothing too special people like you and me. I mean, I'm not a queen like Esther, and I'm not in a position of power. I'm a stay-at-home mum, trying to do my best. What can I really do? Well, can I just look at one other character in the Bible? Joseph. Now, most of you are thinking about Joseph and his coat of technical cut. It's coat of many colours, aren't you? Because he did some amazing things with his ability to interpret dreams. But I'm not talking about him. I'm talking about Joseph the carpenter. The man that in the nativity play, no child wants to be. You know, all his life he served his community making furniture and utensils. He raised a family in a small, unimportant town. His family had a bit of an amazing and rocky start 
when they had to travel to Bethlehem and then hide out in Egypt. But mostly, they lived in Galilee, an unimportant small town. You know, he spent his life teaching his children the ways of the Torah. He led them in the Jewish customs and festivals, including a yearly trip to Jerusalem. Does that sound familiar? He sounds like most of us, doesn't he? Well, just like we can, he chose to put his life into the hands of God. He chose to love what others, he chose to love others. And you know, he chose to love when others would have condemned. He chose to step up when others would have stepped back. He chose to face hardship when others would have taken the easy way out. Without him, Mary would have been left abandoned and disgraced. Jesus would have grown up without the love, protection and guidance of a dad. A dad who was prepared to love God and love, serve God and love those around him. A dad who showed the way to the one who is the way. He taught truth to the one who is the truth. And he helped bring life to the one who is the life. Talk about feeling inadequate. You know, he never even saw what his faithfulness, love, sacrifice, time and effort accomplished. He died before Jesus even started his ministry. You might not feel like you're very important, but don't let that stop you knowing just how significant you are. You were created by the creator of all things. You might not feel like you've got real purpose, but don't let that stop you doing what you can. God is the master painter. Your life has meaning. He will use you if you let him, even if you can't see it or never even get to see it. Choose each day to walk in obedience to him, to let his power work in you and through you, to love God and others in all you do and to serve him willingly, whether you're an Esther or a Joseph. You are significant. You have purpose. You can be life-giving. Earlier I said, maybe you haven't put your life into God's hands. Today, if you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Saviour, if you've never asked him to come into your life so that you can live a life of significance, of purpose, a life that is full of the greatest life, then please pray with me. Father, I want to thank you that you created me. You created me and I am significant. I want to thank you that you have purposes and plans for my life. And right now, I want to say sorry for trying to do things on my own, for living my own way. And I want to turn from that and I want to decide today that I am going to live for you. Father, I place my life into your hands. I thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die for me so that I could have true life. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.
Christina Morrison, please show your appreciation in the chat. Once again, so helpful to every one of us. As we look at these various characters, isn't it good to know that God also has a plan and purpose for our life? Now listen, as Christina shared there, perhaps you've never responded to Jesus. Perhaps you've never said, I want Jesus Christ to be my Lord. But when Christina prayed at the end that you said yes, well, if you did, would you get that in the chat? Would you just simply say, I said yes, and someone will be in contact with you. We really want to help you move forward in this incredible journey of what it means to know and love Jesus. Hey, we want to say thank you for your continuous gen uh, generosity in your giving. We are so thankful. I was speaking again to a dear friend just yesterday, and we were just sharing our appreciation for the blessing of God that he's giving, given us, but just that ability to so invest into the kingdom of God, the fact that through the local church, we are able to give of our tithes and our offerings. And in doing so, we believe that it is seed that has been planted into good ground. And I want to say thank you for your giving. There are various ways that you can do that. There's the QR code that is coming up on the screen. Some of you have continued to do that online. And of course, you can still go by the office. The information is there on the screen. Never take it for granted 
that people trust us as a local church to move forward with the finance that they commit. And I believe that God is going to richly bless you in an incredible way, his favor resting upon you. Can I also ask you to continue to pray for our uh, Community Cafe Wednesdays? What a ministry this is. I want to tell you, especially if you're a part of this local church, this ministry is reaching far beyond our expectation. Being able to bless those that perhaps are facing a season or a time that they're facing maybe a challenge in finance, which is restricting what they're able to go out and buy. And here at our community cafe, we are encouraging people. We have for free to give to folks a, a lovely bowl of soup, a sandwich, a piece of fruit, and a bottle of water. But more than that, why don't you come in person? There are some that just come, receive, and go. But there are those that are coming, sitting down, and we're having a great chat and, and able to just bring encouragement. If you're feeling a little bit down right now, if you've had a bad week, why don't you come along Wednesday? Let's engage and chat. Let's pray together, and let's believe for a fa blessed and favored future in God. And can I encourage you, let's pray over this ministry, pray over this staff, pray for every single one that is involved in that. Can I remind you that at 2 o'clock you can register to come in person, 9.30, 11.30 on a Sunday. We actually have in-person services. Perhaps you've never been. Perhaps you, you're coming along as a visitor. You won't be a visitor for very long. You will be a friend. There is something incredible about being in person. Yeah, check us out online. But why don't you come and be with us? I tell you, what a great time we're having together. And there's just something about that community that I believe is special. So registration opens at 2 o'clock. The purpose of registration is for track and trace. Really believing that this is going to be an incredible week. Well, I just sense the favor and blessing of God upon you. In these next few days, I'm really praying that what the Bible calls immediately moments, the Bible calls suddenly moments, the Bible calls straightforward, straightway moments. I am believing that something incredible is going to happen directly into your world. I am believing that God is going to move on your behalf. You may say, well, Neil, that's a big statement to make. It is a big statement to make, but I believe that we serve a great God. Well, may his blessing rest upon you. May you know his presence and may you be aware of his favor. In Jesus' name, this is Neil signing off. God bless you. Then to